So if you were going to think about that psychologically, um, the fact that women were asking for uh, freedom uh, without the responsibility that would come with it, you know, so being taken care of, having freedom, but also being taken care of. So having both sides of it. Yes. What kind of psychological attitude would bring about that kind of a desire? Because it's not a, it's not a uh, finding truth through love kind of desire. It's finding, it's finding what, what I want, what mm -hmm. I need, what I deserve. It's, you know, it's all, it sounds like it's all focused on the woman's side of things. And it's a pretty narrow view. So how do you, how do you just, yeah. do, can you describe the, the psychological uh, makeup of a woman and, and the doctrines that were being laid down in history of, of what they, where their point of view was, was from, like what kind of point of view? It sounds very self-pitying. It sounds like self-pity. Yeah. Pretty much. I agree. Uh, and but why would that be the case? Why would they be in mm. that situation? And feel that way. I do think that, and you know, this is you're you're getting at the the core really, and and it's a question that I ask over and over again. And and part of the answer, I think, is that once you become convinced that the history of your group, and we're talking about uh, mm -hmm. sexual antagonism, but I think it can apply to other. Uh, group identities. Once you become convinced that the history of your group is this history of unremitting, cruel oppression, in which you have been denied even the most basic rights and principles, and in which the other side, the oppressor group, has taken everything and given nothing. And that is over and over again, the feminist position the feminist description of women's lot. Once you believe that that's true, then I think you lose any empathy or ability to see things from the other group's point of view or to accept that they too might have had their sorrows, their burdens, their difficulties, their suffering. You simply shut your mind to it. You don't believe that it's true anymore. And you believe then that, that actually you might not say it in that manner, and in fact, feminists deny it, but you would believe that a kind of revenge, you know, a collective um, process of group vengeance is perfectly justified, that now men must be made to pay. They have left a bloody, you know, blood-stained trail of women's tears and suffering and oppression of mind and body. So now they deserve to pay just some fraction even of what they have inflicted on others. And women deserve to be liberated from those burdens and supported. And I really think that that is maybe not the whole story, but I think it is a big part of it. And there's a fascinating novel. It's one of the, one of the videos I made is about Henry James's novel, The Bostonians. He describes exactly that psychology. And this is a novel that was published in 1886. And he's describing the situation that he observed, I assume, in, in the 1870s in the Boston area. And it, he describes the, the, like the coming to feminist consciousness of the two women, Olive Chancellor and Verena Tarrant in, in the novel as exactly that. Like basically they immerse themselves in these stories of, of women's oppression. And they, they believe that men you know, have always been privileged, that in every situation, men benefit and they use women for their own pleasure and purposes. And so they came to believe that now was the time for men to pay for what they had done. And uh, you see that even in a um, little earlier, if you go back to 1848, uh, which is in some ways the, the origins of the, fem the organized feminist movement in the United States. Uh, and this was a, a women's convention that took place 
at Seneca Falls, New York, and it was led by the woman who became the acknowledged leader of the American women's movement, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And she and other, mostly women who had been involved in the abolition movement, um, and then who had become um, politicized as a result of their activism uh, in the movement to abolish slavery. And they had become angry about what they saw as, as women's subordinate status uh, in their society generally and in that movement. And they signed a, a document called the Declaration of Sentiments. And it was modeled on the Declaration of Independence. And it was essentially a declaration of war against male sex, slavery, and subjugation of women. And their primary statement in that document, which a number of women, I forget the exact number, over 100 women signed who, who participated in the convention, and men signed it too. And it said that the history of mankind is the history of repeated injuries and usurpation on the part of men against women the objective of which is to establish an absolute tyranny over her. That's what they said was the entire history of mankind. And men present, well-intentioned abolitionist men who had attended the conference, signed it, admitting that they were participants in this, uh, act, you know, this, this horrible history of repeated injuries and usurpation in an attempt to establish an absolute tyranny over women. 